Welcome to Classes in Session presented by UI Health. I'm Doug Glanville. Major sporting events are everywhere, sometimes living in the weather-specific nature of the Olympics, other times in the rhythmic ending of a competitive season that seeks to crown a champion. These events are hosted somewhere in the world, a home field advantage over the entire globe, where all eyes are taking in the culture and image of what these hosts want us to see. Cooperative competition supports the competitive requirements of those on the field of play and what they are representing. They must all agree on the rules, all agree on what values they are upholding, and in that accord, the venue seeks to reflect those values. At times, this turns the event into a mask, covering the ways host cities and nations are misaligned to what these games seek to promote. At its darkest, these places are trying to wash clean their image, which at times can rise to the level of oppression. Are they truly committed to the values, or are they just using the moment to point the camera in the best direction of their global agenda? Today, we explore sports washing. We will do so with TJ Quinn, renowned investigative journalist with ESPN, who has covered topics ranging from international doping scandals to the imprisonment of Brittany Griner, and Dr. Jules Boykoff, former pro soccer player, now professor of politics and government at Pacific University, with deep insights into the forum of the Olympic Games. Let's get to class. During my baseball career, we had a term to describe when a player did something to make it appear he was doing more than he was doing. An optical illusion of effort and productivity. A Jedi mind trick meant to distract observers through an unnecessary dive in the outfield or trying to rob a home run on a ball that was 60 rows up in the upper deck. We call it eyewash. It is named after the cleaning system you find in chemistry labs across the world in case you get something in your eye that could melt steel that you must clean out immediately. You rinse and the process hopefully clears everything out. In the sporting world, the term sports washing has the same effect and it is as old as sport itself. Using events, exhibitions and the circus of mass fanaticism to obscure the truth about the hosts. The wash cleans out the dirt, but at this level it attempts to turn your head away or even convince you that you're not seeing what you were seeing before that fresh rinse went through. Nothing to see here. The World Cup, Olympic Games, FIFA, Formula One, and every other major sporting institution are always confronted with who gets to host. A bidding war for this privilege also comes with the opportunity to use the events to reshape public opinion. Human rights violations, oppression, and subjugation of a people can be put on pause just long enough to see new images of a future through cooperative and competitive sport, hiding behind the hope of meritocracy and fair play. The homeless are then moved, workers who died in venue construction become footnotes or go undercounted. Yet it is hiding in plain sight. An image may not be truly repaired after these events, at least to the outside, but it could present an aspirational future that gains traction internally, a nation that could be changing its stripes, even if those stripes could be prison bars in a certain light. It is in the game of money that power is drawn to wash away inconvenient truths about how that power may be wielded. In this case, a soft power that may not involve invasion or artillery, but leverages the other ways a nation can influence, the calculation has been made that sports have a way of subduing the tension without firing a shot, presenting the chance to make aspiration visible or downright deception invisible when the world is watching. The best of sport and how it can entice us to see teamwork and cooperation, fairness and egalitarian society is an example that leads us down a road where we can expand from there. That anything or anyone in proximity must live by the same virtues as its merits, we assume. Sports encourage us, but it can also blind us. Boycotts will come and go, but sports washing is here to stay, and the debate rages on about if all sports washing is to be treated with equal skepticism and disdain. Let's welcome in our guest, TJ Quinn, a longtime investigative reporter with ESPN, has done incredible journalism covering such stories as Brittany Griner in Russia, and also the doping scandals throughout Major League Baseball and other sports. So welcome in, TJ. Thanks, Doug. Good to be with you. All right. Well, you know, we're considering a term that's been, you know, thrust into to the center stage that's called sports washing. And uh, I guess I want to start off by when you hear that word sports washing, what do you think of? 
Well, it's it's using sports to whitewash uh, really human rights abuses. That's that's essentially what it comes down to. Um, it's old tried and true method of uh, both ensuring soft power at home and abroad. It's a way of taking what can be some very ugly things in, in any regime or sometimes even democratic nations and, uh, and try to put a good face on it. Well, you think about uh, how these events often like the Olympics are hosted by a nation. Uh, it, what are the connections between sort of the culture of the host as opposed to some of the other issues that actually played beyond the host border, so to speak? Yeah, this, it, I mean, it really all goes back to 36 Berlin when Adolf Hitler used, and more specifically, Joseph Goebbels used the Olympics as a way to make, make Nazi Germany look like a legitimate nation. Um, you know, by that point, the, the growing atrocities, I mean, again, you know, we're, we're several years before the Holocaust. Um, but you still had seen anti-Jewish laws passed, the Nuremberg laws. Uh, Germany was, you know, headed down its path, and they looked at those Olympics as a way to make Germany look like this strong, credible nation. Um, like, uh, there's always an issue when you try to draw a direct line between something going on today and Nazi Germany. It, you know, happens a little, little too often. But the fact is, this is that that's really the strongest example, and it also told people inside Nazi Germany, and this is crucial lesson that leaders have taken all the way up to the present is it sends a message to your own citizens. See, the rest of the world accepts us. We're a major nation that is respected on the world stage. Well, and it, it brings me to thinking about, uh, you know, sort of the jurisdiction of this, right? You have nations that have rules and laws in their own countries, and then they come to one place and they're trying to fuse this international coalition around sports as, you know, competition. And, and so how how is that often reconciled in terms of, you know, who sort of has that final say, depending on the event, as to what is presented? Yeah, I mean, it's we're seeing it play out in, in Qatar right now, where supposedly, you know, going into this tiny country was going to, you know, that the, the benefits of sport were going to, you know, overshadow the, the issues they've had with, you know, the, death of thousands of workers, the exploitation of those workers from poorer countries, particularly Nepal, um, uh, the anti, anti-LGBTQ, um, you know, culture that exists in the country. And what did you see this past week? Johnny Inventino, the head of FIFA, instead of using whatever power he's got to try to pressure Qatar, it's been the opposite. He has defended them, calling Western nations and European nations hypocrites. Uh, and, and you always wonder in these moments, like, what what's the way forward? You know, you think about, you mentioned uh, Germany, and then there was Jesse Owens. And and Jesse Owens, by having this individual dominance, it's kind of pushing back of this Aryan-Germany concept of supremacy. Uh, and then the world seeing that, there is some value in that parameter around human rights. No, uh, Jesse Owens is a great point. Um, I mean, you look at, at the symbolism of his victory and how embarrassing that was for Hitler. But did it keep him from going into Czechoslovakia? Did it take, you know, keep him from taking Poland? Um, you know, but you, you asked this key question. Did, did any places um, rules change for the better uh, because of engagement? So. To me, it's been the opposite, that, that these countries are simply encouraged, okay, we, we got everything we wanted from these games. We got the attention. We got the money. We were never held accountable. And under any autocrat is going to continue to push and push as far as, as he can. And I say he deliberately because the, these are all men. We continue with TJ Quinn, plus Professor Jules Boykoff relates his experience as an international soccer player as the World Cup kicks off and the concept of sports washing takes center stage in Qatar. Next on Classes in Session with Doug Glanville, presented by UI Health. Welcome back to Classes in Session with Doug Glanville, presented by UI Health as we continue our conversation with ESPN investigative reporter, TJ Quinn. Do you see any pathway forward through the individual athletes? As you mentioned, maybe not having the geopolitical power, 
But in the grassroots levels, there is a lot of power. And do you see any possibility individually? You know, we, I know you covered a lot with Brittany Griner, it's her imprisonment in, in Russia. Um, what have you seen from the individual? Where is there hope there? The problem with international sport is you've got athletes from countries where they're completely dependent on the government for, for their living. Um, you've got language barriers, you've got geographic barriers, you've also got very short careers with very short windows for success. Uh, and so it's really tough to organize a bunch of athletes in those conditions. And when the top athletes like Martin Fourcade tried to, to organize somewhat, they got stuck because not athlete, you know, not every athlete from every country was, was willing to put their careers on the line. It's always the hope that somehow the athletes could find a stronger voice, but they haven't been able to do it. Well, I'm curious, you know, given that you mentioned games in LA and do you see a different opportunity now when these games end up back in say United States or France or, uh, you know, more, I guess, progressive nation, so to speak, uh, do you see an opportunity there of sort of claw back, uh, the sort of imagery and align it a little bit more with some of the, you know, the base attendance of the IOC charter, which really lays out what these games are about. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's what they say they do, but it never happens. You know, you, you don't see lasting political change out of any of these, these events. You see the opposite. So why would LA be any different? I don't know. I think what it does is shows the IOC, uh, it shows the world that, hey, even the United States, you know, went ahead and did everything the IOC wanted in order to have these games here. Well, TJ, I really appreciate uh, your insights. Incredible experience you've had in just covering sports on every landscape, let alone international. And, um, you know, just learning about sports watching this term that we're going to hear more and more and understanding like how much it's caught on this treadmill and very all of us are curious, like where this goes from here. But I appreciate you adding all the context to give us some insights. Uh, anytime. Glad to do it. And, and you know, people hopefully remember this conversation uh, when we see what happens with, uh, with Saudi Arabia and its desire to, to have a World Cup. Very excited for our next guest, Dr. Jules Boykoff, who is a professor at Pacific University of Politics and Government and has done tremendous work on the Olympics and dissent. And he has experience as a former professional soccer player, so he covers all the bases. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you. Well, I'm excited about this topic because sports washing is a term that's kind of been bubbling more and more to the front. Uh, when you think about evaluating sports, their impact, especially on the international stage. So at a baseline, I guess I want to understand how you'd even define sports washing in your context. Great place to start. So for me, sports washing is when political leaders use sports events to try to distract attention from their human rights record, from things that are happening on the domestic front, and to try to make them look good, legitimate on the world stage in ways that can advance their political goals as well as their economic goals. And you know, one of the things that's different about the way I talk about sports washing than maybe other people is I definitely put democratic countries in the realm of producing sports washed events. So for example, uh, Los Angeles has the Olympics coming up in 2028. And the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, said that if they were to get the Olympics, that would help them get rid of homelessness as a problem before the Olympics arrived in 2028. And so it's not just regimes like in Qatar or Beijing, although they absolutely engage in sports washing as well, but it can happen in almost any political context. And when you think about the term soft power, the idea that you're leveraging something that's not necessarily military, but in this subtle way or more subtle way to sort of sway public opinion, uh, the elements that are kind of combined or at least relatable across the spectrum, not just the host nation, but gentrification or homelessness, labor. I mean, what do you see in the common thread between those elements? Yeah, soft power is another way of thinking through these sports mega events and their power. And what I talk about a lot with sports washing that, again, is a little bit different is that when we think about does sports washing work, we shouldn't just think about how it happens in the international arena as soft power practitioners often do. 
But actually, sports washing is really important domestically. Just look at, for example, what happened in Russia when they hosted the 2014 Sochi Winter Olympics. Ahead of those games, they were getting all sorts of negative coverage because of a series of anti-gay propaganda laws that they had passed. But what happened was inside of Russia, that law and the fact that Putin stood up to the West and its decadence and also because it carried off this sports mega event, Putin was incredibly popular after those Olympic Games. He actually got his highest approval ratings in the wake of the Sochi 2014 Winter Olympics. Uh, and, and to your point about the effectiveness, clearly it, it has some success, whether domestically, but what has it been on the international stage? Have you seen a, a connection between its impact in terms of the, the view of that nation outside of its borders? Great question. And yes, definitely. It depends on how you look at things. So actually, we're in talking in the middle of the Qatar World Cup, which a lot of people are pointing to as sort of an epic fail of sports washing. But if you look at it from the angle that you're suggesting, Doug, you might be able to see that it might not be this big epic fail. Yes, absolutely. Qatar is getting all sorts of negative attention and deservedly so for its oppressive system around migrant laborers, for its laws that discriminate against LGBTQ people where you can end up in prison for seven years, and for its treatment of women who often have to have a, a man in charge of big decisions in their lives. Yes, they're getting lots of negative attention, but they're also demonstrating to corporations that are interested in doing business in Qatar that they're a modern country, that now they have lots of hotels that they had built because of the World Cup, and they're sending a message to even the United States where there's a huge military presence in Qatar that we are a stable country, we can get things done, we're reliable, we can construct buildings when needed, and you can keep feeding us arms. Coming up, more with Professor Jules Boykoff and how sports and politics seem forever intertwined. We'll be right back on Classes in Session with Doug Glanville, presented by UI Health. Welcome back to Classes in Session with Doug Glanville, presented by UI Health, as we continue with Professor Jules Boykoff. Well, and given a, a tremendous history, for example, with Olympic Games, international competition, there is, you know, there's a curve, a learning curve about how this actually works, right? Sports washing happened. This is how it's used. Here are the things that we didn't like and the feedback. Uh, how come we're not sort of, I guess, IOC or whatever institution keeping up with how to pr put, uh, put in more guardrails around uh, the sort of negative impact of sports washing? Yeah, that question keeps me up at night, to be honest with you, Doug. I mean, why doesn't the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, do more to stand up for the principles that are enshrined in its Olympic Charter, for example. It's got all sorts of wonderful ideas about anti-discrimination, about people being able to be who they are despite uh, any, any laws that are in the land. Uh, why don't they? Because there is tons of money swishing through the Olympic system, and they basically want to just try to keep the status quo. Uh, and, and speaking of the money, you know, a lot of these games, you know, billions of dollars we're talking about investing in, who is really getting wealthy off of it? Where, where, you know, where does it, you, you often see, you know, Rio or towns where there's, you know, just dilapidated former, you know, equipment user venues for these, for these games. I mean, where is it actually going where that incentive of cost versus social value is, is sort of, uh, sort of pitted against each other? More and more people around the world are asking that very question, and it's making it more difficult for the Olympics to land in particular cities because of a series of issues that go right to where you're going there, Doug. So for starters, I think the Olympics are a perfect example of trickle-up economics, where the benefits that accrue tend to flow upwards to those who are already doing quite well in terms of economic positioning, in terms of their political careers. Where does the money Low. Well, first of all, it is public money that is largely used for the Olympic Games, and yet the benefits tend to go to private entities who are involved. So take every single Olympics going back to 1960, according to one study from Oxford University, and every one of those Olympics going back to 1960 had cost overruns. In other words, they engaged in what I call etch-a-sketch economics, where in the bid <laughs> phase, they say, 
it's only going to cost this much. And then they get the Olympics, they shake up the head etch sketch and then they draw a brand new number on it, which is inevitably higher. And this happens in city after city after city. You know, you mentioned uh, Rio de Janeiro. I had the good fortune of living there as a Fulbright Research Fellow ahead of and then during the 2016 Olympics. And I saw with my own two eyes the misspending of money on the Olympics. There was plenty of other places that it could have been spent in town. There's a group right now called Global Athlete. They put out a fascinating study that they did with Toronto Metropolitan University recently. And what they did was they compared the amount of money that athletes from these different sports like the NFL, the English Premier League of Soccer, NHL, NBA, what those leagues got compared to Olympic athletes. And with those other leagues, NBA and so on, the athletes claimed between 45 and 60 percent of the revenues, 45 to 60. For the Olympics, the athletes only get 4.1 percent. That's incredible. It is so low. And so there's been a big upsurge in athletes standing up for justice, including the justice around how they're paid, how the money shuffle works. And for me, that's really going to be one of the keys moving forward to reform the Olympics. Well, Dr. Borkoff, I really want to appreciate your time here and incredible insight. Uh, we're all smarter and learn certainly a lot about a term that's really come to the forefront in sports washing and, and what we can do to kind of get back to the core spirit or at least reestablish the core spirit of Olympics and many other competitions that are supposed to be fair and inclusive. Uh, so thank you for enlightening us on that. Thank you for this conversation. Appreciate the opportunity, Doug. International play at the highest level is a sandbox. Inside its borders, we seek to teach and celebrate values like sharing, cooperation, patience, inclusion, and fairness. This is also the best version of sport, competing with the opportunity to open minds, change hearts, and come together through a shared passion. Yet these games come with a financial windfall for some, or as Dr. Boykoff opens and frames as trickle-up economics. And whenever money becomes primary, Values can melt away as a nuisance to the bottom line, so human rights get no deeper than performative gestures with little appetite for true change. And in the end, sports washing allows many opportunist nations and other power brokers to hide behind those values and build value for their own interests. Sure, we get to all enjoy upsets like Saudi Arabia beating Argentina in the World Cup or the greatness of a superstar athlete like Simone Biles. But when the smoke clears and the torch is snuffed out, we are left with medals and memories. We can all be understandably blinded by the excellence and shine of the gold, silver, and bronze, but we still have to ask what is behind their glare and what did we give up to bask in it. I'm Doug Glanville. See you in class.